Well, John was an avid golfer. Every Saturday, he, he'd get up early in the morning, he'd go out and he'd play golf. He came in that afternoon and his wife Mary said to him, John, who did, who did you play golf with today? He said, oh, no one in particular. And Mary said to him, John, how come you never play golf with Bill anymore? You know, you used to play with him every Saturday morning. John said, would you want to play with someone who throws their clubs, swears, lies about his score, moves his ball in the rough, and talks while you're trying to swing? And Mary said, of course not. And John said, neither would Bill. Do you ever have those days when you're ashamed of what you've done or what you're like and people never want to be around you? You know, those days when the ugly side of you comes out. I used to see the ugly side of me that would come out when I was driving in the city of Pittsburgh. We lived in Beachview in the South Hills and you had to go through the South Hills Tunnel to get to downtown. And I belonged to the city club. It was a, a place where i go to exercise and work out. But when you would leave the club, and if it was rush hour during Pittsburgh, it was an adventure. So I'd get out of the 7th Street parking garage, I'd go to the light, i make a left, and i go to the two-lane on-ramp to go home. And quickly, the two lanes turned into five lanes. And people are trying to na navigate and joggy for position because you had to get down to one lane in this spot to get through the tunnel. And I'll tell you, it was wild. People are honking horns, windows are down, hand gestures are going out. People are yelling and screaming at one another. And you know what? I did the same, but I never did the hand gesture. <laughs> but I got to tell you, I couldn't believe how competitive and how angry I was when someone would try to maneuver in front of me and push me out of the way, and how much venom would spew out of my mouth as I'd yell out the window at people. This was a regular occurrence, and I'm ashamed to say that and confess it before you. But it was something that God used probably three days a week to remind me that, Tim, you really are a sinner. You're no better than anybody else. Just because you have a title in front of your name, Reverend, you still are a sinner. Ever feel that way in your life? You know, sometimes we need to take and pause and confess our brokenness. Our Wesley Hurd used to say this about the Scriptures. The Scriptures do not lie when they portray humanity as deceitful, rebellious, lost sinners. That's who I am. That's why when we look at the story today, as Nathan was talking about Saul changing to Paul, it's so powerful. It is a sobering and at the same time a hopeful reminder that none of us can take our sinful, rebellious selves and make ourselves into something new. Only God can change us. And only God can do that. The story of Saul's conversion to Paul is found in several passages throughout the New Testament. So I'm going to try to piece this story together with different passages. We pick up in the book of Acts where Saul is bent on capturing and arresting the Jewish men and women who dared to proclaim that the long-awaited Messiah, Jesus, had come. Paul was so upset with the people 
who believed that Jesus had come. They were called followers of the way. He was so upset with them that he wanted them to be dead. He wanted them to be imprisoned. It says, uttering threats with every breath, eager to kill the Lord's followers. So he went to the high priest and he requested letters addressed to the synagogues in Damascus, asking for their cooperation in the rest of any of the followers of the way he found there. He wanted to bring them, both men and women, back to Jerusalem in chains. But a surprising thing happened when he went on the road to Damascus to capture and persecute the Christian followers of the way. On that 140-mile trip to Damascus, without any warning, a light, from heaven flashed and Saul fell to the ground. A voice said to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. And the voice replied, I am Jesus, the one you are persecuting. At this point, you might expect God would have destroyed Saul, pulverized him. After all, he was persecuting Christ's church. He had watched in approval as Stephen in the seventh chapter of the book of Acts was martyred for his faith. It says that Saul's followers took off their coats, laid them at his feet, while he persecuted and killed Stephen, the first martyr. Saul was going everywhere to destroy the church. He went from house to house, dragging out both men and women to throw them into prison. So you wouldn't blame Jesus for sending Saul to the scrap heap. But instead, Jesus recycled him and gave him a new and godly purpose. Now get up and go into the city, Jesus said, and you will be told what you must do. The flash of light, the presence of God, literally blinded Saul. He couldn't see a thing. So his companions led him by the hand to Damascus. And for three days, he lived in total darkness, not eating or drinking. Meanwhile, the risen Christ spoke to a disciple named Ananias, who also was in Damascus. And he called to him, I want you to go to Straight Street in Damascus, and find Saul. But Lord, explained Ananias, I've heard many people talk about the terrible things this man has done to believers in Jerusalem. I can't blame Ananias for his reaction toward this man who was so feared among the Christians. It was natural to want to condemn Saul rather than care for him. But you see, Jesus had plans for the persecutor of the church. And in order to prepare him, God tore Saul down. But he didn't tear him up. God had plans for him. So he said, go, Ananias, for Saul is my chosen instrument to take my message to the Gentiles and to the kings and to the people of Israel. God had a plan to take the strength, the intelligence, the commitment, the eloquence that Saul had before his conversion and redirect it and put it in a new use. 
Well, Ananias reluctantly obeyed, and he made this visit to his enemy. And he saw that the Holy Spirit was working on Saul. Ananias watched in surprise as something like scales fell from Saul's eyes, and his sight was restored. He watched with wonder as Saul got up, and he asked to be baptized. And then only after he was baptized did he begin to eat some food and gain some strength. And Ananias watched with awe as Saul started to go to the synagogues in Damascus. Not to arrest the Christians this time, but to join them in proclaiming that Jesus is the Son of God. In the process, Saul found himself with a new name, Paul. And he was given a new purpose in life. You see, God is in the business of recycling and repurposing. God doesn't waste anything. I asked in the beginning of the service for you to name something you were about to throw out. And instead of throwing it out, you repurposed it. So some of you wrote in, Nisi, I started to throw out some fried, fried chicken, but boiled it down with some onions and gravy and made smothered chicken instead. John Puff writes, as a kid, I made an old tire into a swing. It gave us many happy summer days. Mark wrote, newspapers to place under my tomato plants. Jesse, I've been repurposing containers like yogurt tubs, toilet paper rolls, and egg cartons. Robert, my dad's travel mugs, which are now used for housing my daughter's small toys. You know what I like to repurpose? Pallets. And I've used them to, for a bike rack and for shelving. And you know I like to use them to make uh, large nativity scenes at Christmas time. But this Christmas, I, went, I took the wood from the pallets and we made small nativity scenes and sent them to our two children's families. I love to repurpose things. We had a chance this week to talk to the Malesia family, to hear about the interesting way that they repurposed some of the important family names. Hey, and Malizia I want you to family. watch this, if you would. Uh, we're Hi. Glad. Hi, we're really glad to be able to talk with you. Um, Mom and dad are Dulcie and Mark, and we know Dulcie because she does child care at the church for us, and we know the kids because they come to children's ministry. Um, and you guys agreed to tell us a little bit about your names. So I want to ask the kids, first of all, can you tell us your full names? And G, we're going to start with you. What's your whole name, honey? Graziano Tommaso Malizia. Great. And Rory, how about you? Rory Audrey Martins Malizia. Say it one more time. Rory Audrey Martins Malizia. Thank you. So, Dulcie and Mark, um, I, I think there's some special story behind how you came up with the names for your children. Would you be willing to share that? Yes. Sure. We'll start with uh, Graziano. So my mother, her first name was Graziella, and she passed away going to be 14 years ago this March, my senior year in high school. Um, so when we had G, thought it'd be nice to kind of give him, it's not direct, but kind of the male version of her name in Graziano. So that's how we came up with it. That's how we got his first name. And then his middle name, Tommaso, 
is actually after my father-in-law, Dulcie's father, whose first name is Thomas. And Tommaso is just the Italian equivalent of Thomas. So, so. Great, thank <laughs> uh, you. Graziano got his name. And then with Rory, um, so my parents got my name, Dulcie, from an old TV show. And so when I found out that I was having a girl, um, I wanted to kind of do the same thing. And I loved the show Gilmore Girls. So I, I used the name Rory from that show. And then um, my great aunt, so my dad's aunt, um, Audrey, was somebody super special to me. Um, I, I, she was a huge part of my life. Um, and so I knew right away I wanted that to be her middle name. And um, Mark actually adopted Rory. Um, and I know my brother and sister-in-law don't want to have children. So we kept Marthans in there as a second middle name. And then um, uh, actually a month before her second birthday, she became Milizia. Oh, very nice. So we're grateful for the special names that all of you have. And uh, we're going to ask God to just bless you. And uh, we're grateful that we also know Jesus, whose name is above all names. So have a happy day. God bless. Thank, Thank you. you guys. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. <laughs> Goodbye. You know, unwanted things and special names are not the only things that God can repurpose. Do you know that every strength, talent, insight, and experience we have, whether secular or sacred, rough or smooth, bad or good, can be a building block for the Lord to use? You see, God doesn't destroy the raw materials of the lives we have lived, but instead he recycles them. And he refashions and reshapes them into something new. God uses regret as an important step in the recycling process. These emotions are meant to, to weigh heavily on us until they become so heavy that we must either turn to God to lift the burden or we're going to perish from the weight. But once we turn and give our lives back to God, we can experience the freedom of letting the regret and the baggage of our past and let it go and know that God can use those experiences to help us flourish. As Christians, people of the way, regret is not the final emotion we should feel for anything we have done, or even the selfish choices and destructive decisions we have made. Ultimately, Jesus doesn't want our regrets. He wants the raw materials of our lives and a willing spirit so that he can create something new. Behold, the old is finished and gone, and Jesus has created something new in us. It looks different for each of us. Maybe for you, it will be repurposing your passion for secular music into a commitment to play on the worship team. Or if you have the gift of technology, and you want to be a part of the tech team and to proclaim the good news online to the world. Or maybe you have the gift of administration. And so you might have the opportunity to serve on a board for homeless people to find quality living. For some of you, it may mean taking the pain of an unhappy childhood and transforming it into a passion for children or youth ministry. Maybe some of you have suffered the death of a loved one and God would provide an opportunity for you to come along someone who is grieving as well. 
Or maybe there's a mistake that you have made and you're agonizing over it. And God wants you to share your pain with someone else who might have had a similar mistake in their lives. Maybe like Paul, it will mean using an experience of being far from God to bring others who are still far from God closer to God. Maybe you could use Alpha to do that. God wastes nothing when he's looking for people to do his work in the world. God's grace toward Paul and towards us is not in vain. You know, the Lord paints a beautiful picture with the broken brushes and the sloppy colors of our lives. Some churches understand this and make it a building block of their ministries. At Saddleback Church in Southern California, you cannot lead a small group's ministry that is focused upon healing unless you have struggled yourself with a particular brokenness being addressed by the group. So that if you're going to lead a group of alcoholics, you must be a recovering alcoholic. If you're going to lead a group with men and women who are struggling with pornography, you must be someone who has regained a grip on your life and no longer held slave to pornography. If you're going to help women who are healing from the trauma of abortion, you must have had an abortion to lead that group. You see, members of Saddleback Church know that the treasure of Jesus Christ is found in fragile clay jars. So that in the words of the Apostle Paul, it may be made clear that this extraordinary power belongs to God and does not come from us. The good news today and every day is this. We don't have to achieve perfection before God can restore us and use us. For sure, it's important for us to re repent of our sins and strive to live lives that are Christ-like. But God will work his purposes out regardless how righteous we are. That's a shock to many people, but it's true. God will achieve his purposes regardless of the state of our souls. It's the Lord God Almighty who's in charge and not we weak human beings. God took Saul and redirected all of his passion, influence, and strength so that he could start doing business as Paul. And if you and I are willing to walk in his footsteps, we need to be willing to be reshaped by the hands of the master builder and the master recycler, the master repurposer. We have to be willing to stop clinging to the baggage and the regrets in our lives and to truly experience God's forgiveness so he can reshape us and use our experiences to give us new life and new purpose. God has given each of us certain building blocks in our lives. He's given us strengths and talents, insights and experiences, good and bad. And we may not have chosen some of them, but God will not let any of them go to waste. 
The reworking of our lives by God sometimes can be very painful, stressful. And the reshaping can be a difficult process that we have to endure. But in all of these transformations, God is at work. Do you remember the words that Paul spoke to the Philippians? I am certain of this, that God who began a good work within you will continue his work. He will bring it to completion until it is finally finished on the day when Christ Jesus returns. And Paul continues to remind them, it is God who is at work in you, enabling you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. So take heart. With God, nothing is trashed. Not even you. Nothing is wasted. Not even your worst experiences. Without minimizing your pain or disappointment, God can still transform you and to use you for his purposes if you will allow him. I want to close in prayer and this is going to sound like something simple, but you know the masks that we've been wearing? If you just turn them up a little higher, they can become a blindfold. And if it would be meaningful for you right now, you can make that in a blindfold as we close in prayer and ask God to show us where we are blinded to what he wants to do in our lives. Let's pray. Oh God, there are times in our lives that we need to know your blindness upon us. God, there are so many things that have blinded us. We are blinded by wrong things. We have been blinded by false prophets. We have been blinded by social media. We've been blinded by our education. We've been blinded by our intellectual superiority. We are blinded by our own self-righteousness. God, we have been blinded by the things we have done in the past that we are ashamed of. And God, we are blinded because we think we know better than you. Lord God, save us by sending your blinding light and truth into our lives. Lord God, maybe you would send us an Ananias, a a friend who would come and lead us out of our blindness to you. God, I'm asking this morning if there are people who are far from you. They've been blinded by the thought that they can do life on their own. Oh God, I ask that you would allow the risen Christ to meet them on the road and to let them know that you will can humble them and change them for your purpose and for your glory. God, do not let us any longer waste our lives or any experience we have had. But use it, Lord, for our good and for your glory. Thank you, God, that once I was lost. Once I was so blind. But praise God, now I see. Lord, by the power of your Holy Spirit, take 
take our lives, take our blindness, and use us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and the Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen.